So this morning we're going to be talking about why study the Bible. And, and I, I realized this as I was, you know, laying in bed at night, which is when a lot of thoughts hit me. I, this study is not meant for someone who doesn't believe in God and, you know, just trying to convince them to study the Bible. Uh, there is an argument to be made there, but that's not where I'm going to be focusing. This is rather on those who already believe in God, but perhaps don't f understand or feel the need to study the Bible for themselves. So I'm, I'm going along the lines of someone who already has an understanding that God is real and has a desire to draw closer to God, and that's the approach that I will take this morning. So, um, I invite you to bow your heads with me uh, in prayer as we jump into the text. Heavenly Father, here we are gathered together. We're going to be studying the Bible. And Lord, we believe that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So please, may your Holy Spirit guide us and teach us from your word this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a story I really like when I decided to talk about this. I thought immediately about Luke chapter 24. And if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open to Luke chapter 24. We're going to be spending some time there. I'm not going to have you jump to a bunch of different places. We're going to be spending some time in Luke chapter 24. And this story has a lot of interesting um, insights and, and things that come with it. And, and I hope that as we go through it, uh, some of these things will become more and more clear to you as you follow along with me. Um, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And whatever version you have, as long as you understand it, I'm okay with that. But I'm going to be starting here with verse 13. And you can follow along in your Bibles. You don't have to say it out loud, but I'll be reading out loud. It says, Now behold, two men, two of them, were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus which was how far away? Seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed in reason that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another and walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yet, and yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Are not the Christ who have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So this is the story. Jesus had died three days ago. And these disciples were walking and they were talking and they were sad. And these are not famous disciples. We don't really get their names. We know Cleopas and the friend of his. And we don't really know who they are. All we know is that they were really heartbroken about what had happened. God had done something that they did not expect. They did not understand. And now they're questioning everything. You know, as, as I mentioned last week, last week we talked about prayer. I believe that ministry... If you were to make you know, a stool, it has three legs. And I believe that it's very, very important to have prayer. We talked about that. Prayer as the breathing of the soul. And I encourage you to pray. And we get together on Wednesday nights and we spend time focusing on prayer. Another leg of that stool, I believe, is Bible study. And this story is one of the reasons why I strongly believe in Bible study, why I encourage you to open your Bibles and follow along with me. And we're going to be diving deeper into this. 
I invite you to come back to verse 1 of chapter 24. Actually, even earlier than that, let's go to chapter, verse 55 of chapter 23. So we're still in Luke. We're just looking at the context of the story. We're going back a little bit to see what was going on. See, in verse 55 of Luke chapter 23, it says, And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. So they, they were following Jesus, following the body. They saw the tomb. They saw the body being laid there. And they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And they rested on what day? On the Sabbath, according to the commandment. So these women, Jesus had died on what day? Friday, right? So if anybody's ever unsure which day the Sabbath is, Jesus died on Friday. Many refer to it as Good Friday. The women went there. They saw the tomb where they're laying his body. They made sure to, to follow, be there every step of the way. Interestingly, a lot of the men had run away. But the women stayed faithful, watched, observed, saw it, went back home to prepare everything because of the Sabbath, right? Sunset on Friday, Sabbath time, they went to rest according to the law. It's interesting too, in, in John 19.30, it, it, it quotes Jesus as saying, it is finished. Which for me, it, it points back to creation week. How on the sixth day, God finished everything that he had done. And then on the seventh day, he rested. On the sixth day, on Friday, Jesus says, it is finished. He dies, rests on the Sabbath. And then on, verse, on chapter 24 of Luke, verse 1 says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in and did not find the body of Jesus. Sunday had come. Jesus had work to do. He got up early in the morning and got back at it. Which day is the Sabbath? Well, it's at some point between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. So there is the day. And Jesus is not in the tomb. And verse 4 says, And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And they were, verse 5 says, Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek, why do you seek the living among the dead? Verse 6, He is not here, but he is, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified in the third day rise again remember jesus had talked about this remember what jesus had said these angels are reminding these women of what jesus had spoken verse 8 says then they remembered his words and they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest so there was the 11 disciples and there were others there as well and these women are coming with the gospel with the good news, Jesus is risen. They remembered what he had promised. When the angels spoke, they said, that's right. And they came and they reminded the men, that the 11 disciples that were left and all the others, they were preaching the gospel to them. These women proclaiming that Jesus had been risen. And you know what happened? Verse 10. It says, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, uh, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Verse 11, and their words seemed to them like what? Fables, idle tales. And they did not believe them. So I'm going to open a little parenthesis here, and I hope I don't get in trouble for this. But some people look at the Bible, and they claim that there is lack of, of evidence of women in leadership and if god had wanted to he could have called them and made them leaders and i'd say there's some evidence there and another one is here we have the women preaching the truth the gospel the message but they weren't taken seriously and it makes me wonder whether it was god who did not want to use them or if it was the fact that the culture and the times that they were in prohibited them hindered them from doing what God had called them to do they were doing everything right people just weren't listening and God works with us with where we are and I just wonder if we do that to each other 
if we do that to our children, if we do that when, you know, there's God moving in people to, and to, to call, to, to preach, to share, and we just don't listen to them or put them down or set them aside, you're too young, you're not prepared, this or the other. I don't know. I, I just let, let this bounce around in your heads and, and just consider this story. Peter heard this. It's like, wait, but, you know, it, 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 it sounds like it, it makes sense. Let me go there and check it out. So Peter arose and ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw linen cloths lying by themselves and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. So there is this mystery. Something happened. These women claimed they had visions of angels, but we're not sure. So let's go back to the road to Emmaus. But this time, let's slow down and see what are some of the lessons that we have in this story for us. So with this context in mind, now let's go back and read again through this story. But this time we're going to go a lot slower. And by the way, if you're ever reading the Bible, context is your best friend if you're trying to figure things out. So with this in mind now, behold, two of them, two of the men that were there when the women came and, you know, they were there with the disciples, they were following Jesus, they were heartbroken. Two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of these things which had happened. So we have two people. They're talking about what happened. And you might have noticed this from me already if we've interacted much. I figure things out by talking. You can talk to my poor wife. Uh, she's often in the receiving end of this. And, you know, I just want to talk to her. And she's like, you're just talking at me. I'm like, I'm trying to figure things out, and I do it by talking. So she sits there patiently, patiently as, as we talk. So these men are talking. They're, they're, they're talking about current events and, and their expectations and what's happening, and they're trying to sort this out. And you know what happens as they're talking? Verse 15 it says, and while they conversed in reason, it was while they conversed in reason that Jesus himself did what? Drew near with them. I think there's a principle here. And by the way, I have a whole blog post in case you weren't here around the holidays. I had a sermon entitled God with us. There's this principle in the Bible that God looks for opportunities to be with us. He's seeking out a relationship with us. He's interested in having a conversation, dialoguing a relationship with us. And sure enough, as these two men are talking about Jesus, wondering about Jesus, who shows up? Jesus himself shows up and joins them in the conversation. This is Jesus' approach. As people are talking about him, as people are wondering about him, he just kind of joins in and joins in the conversation. So Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And look at what Jesus does, verse 17. He said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you are having with one another as you walk and you are sad? How come you're sad? What's going on? What are you talking about? No, it could be because I'm an Adventist and that's my bias, my lens through which I look at the Bible. But you know what I see this as an example of? I see this as evidence of an investigative judgment. What do you mean, pastor? This isn't a prophecy seminar. Well, hold on. Follow along with me. Jesus is asking questions. He is investigating. He's trying to find something out. And you could say, pastor, that's silly. Jesus obviously knows what's happened. He was the one on the cross. He knows what's going on. It's like, yeah, I know. But just because he knows doesn't mean he doesn't investigate. Just because he knows doesn't mean he doesn't ask questions. You're going to need more evidence than that, right? Than me just saying that in just this one story. Well, I have all the links to all of this, and I have all this written out on my blog, prmarlin.com. You can go there and look. But just real quick, Genesis 3, 9, God asked Adam, Adam, where are you? Was God really, like, looking for Adam and not able to find him? God knew. But he asked, Adam, where are you? Later, God asks Eve, what is this that you have done? Genesis 3.13. Oh, In Genesis 4.6, God asks Cain, why are you angry? Genesis 4.9, God asks Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Genesis 19.9, God asks Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? So let me ask you, is God investigating? Yes. Is he asking questions? Yes. Is it because he doesn't know the answers? No. He's engaging with us. 
just like he's doing with those disciples so I would propose to you that the fact that God goes through this process of investigating it's not that he's finding new information he's just letting us know he's asking us some questions where are you in your relationship with me where are you in this spiritual journey where do you stand in your walk with God that's why he shows up and he asks questions that's what's happened with Adam and Eve with Cain with Elijah that's what's happening with these two disciples what's going on he knows what's going on he's helping them reflect and ponder and consider what is going on in their lives and how do they relate to these facts yes God engages us God asks questions God investigates but not for him to find out more things but for us to realize where we are in this journey verse 18 there uh, then the ones whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have you not known those things uh, the things which have happened here in these days like are you clueless you're the only stranger here who doesn't know the things that have happened and then Jesus goes along what things and they said to him the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people and now and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him it's interesting that Jesus plays into it ask them these questions because this helps us realize what was going through the mind of a believer three days after Jesus had been crucified if you ever wonder right if I was back then what kind of questions would I be thinking what might I be wondering in my mind and here we have this insight because Jesus asked that question also it's very good to be asked questions because it allows you to figure out your thoughts Jesus asks us questions and let us figure it out how do I answer this what is my relationship with him what do I believe regarding God what do I believe regarding myself in relationship to God and it's good for us to ponder these things and if you're reading the Bible and doing it correctly it'll always cause you to ponder these things it's not just a story about three men way back then it's rather something that causes me to ponder my reality and my walk with God and my relationship with him so they're explaining and they're they're figuring out their thoughts as they're putting them together into these words and it says verse 21 but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel indeed besides all this today is the third day since these things have happened and then they talk about the women how they came up and they had these ideas I love how towards the end of the story verse 25 Jesus rebukes them O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe what to believe in what talk to me to believe in the prophecies did Jesus expect people to study the prophecies but prophecies are hard and they're difficult people get into fights and they give me nightmares but you should be familiar with them you should be familiar with them because at the time of studying them maybe not everything makes sense but one thing that I see in the Bible again and again is that after the prophecies come to pass you look back and you go oh that's what God was talking about right oh I see so there is value in being familiar with the prophecies knowing enough to have a general idea and by the way we're planning we're gonna have some seminars coming up on prophecy we're going to be able to learn a lot more dig a lot deeper but until then just understand that it's, it's important to have some familiarity Jesus is saying why are you so slow to believe in what the prophets have spoken verse 26 ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory verse 27 and beginning at home Moses so the first five books of the Bible in all the prophets he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself now isn't this a, a difficult way a long way for Jesus to reveal himself to these disciples couldn't he have just sort of said hey guys it's me right look at the holes on my hand right he could have just shown himself to them and said look it's me but Jesus didn't want their faith to be based on just miracles and wonders and whatever Jesus looks like because I've seen 
people where their faith, their reason for believing is that they saw the face of Jesus, you know, on their pancake or on their, you know, on the foam in their coffee cup. Or like, how do you even know what Jesus looked like? And I get it that Jesus may use that to sort of start you in that journey, but that's not enough. There has to be more. Your faith has to be grounded on something else. And Jesus here could have revealed himself to them because they knew what he looked like. But rather he takes them to scripture and shows them evidence in the Bible for who he is. And that shows me also that the evidence that Jesus is Jesus is not just that he, you know, healed the sick and multiplied food, but rather that he fulfilled prophecy. That's the biggest, the strongest evidence for who he is. And I would also say that that's probably the reason why we should take time to familiarize ourselves with prophecy. Jesus points to the Bible. And this is interesting because this reminds me of another story um, found in Luke chapter 16. If you want to turn there with me real quick, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. I'm not going to go deep into this parable, but rather I want to look at the end of it, starting with verse 27. This is uh, a parable where Jesus is, you know, illustrating some things and there's a rich man that dies and he thought he was going to go to heaven, but he doesn't. And then he's having this conversation and he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. This is the, the man who had died and, and gone to heaven, supposedly. He says, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place for, of torment. Abraham said to him, they have whom? 1629, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if he goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Verse 31, and I have this marked and underlined in my Bible. But he said to him, if they do not hear whom? Moses and the prophets. Neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead if you don't listen to the bible if the word of the god doesn't speak to your heart and convince you miracles signs and wonders won't change your mind you know john chapter 11 tells us the story of a man called lazarus who was raised from the dead now here's something that Perhaps many of you know, but I remember the first time I read this, it shocked me. So if you want to turn there with me real quick to John chapter 12. John chapter 11, we have the story of you know, Lazarus dies, and maybe one day we'll cover that whole story on here. And I didn't realize that this was in the Bible. John chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. And it says the following. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there talking about jesus and they came not for Jesus' sake only but that they might also see lazarus whom he had risen from the dead verse 10 listen to this part but the chief priests plotted to put lazarus to death also because on account of him many of the jews went away and believed in jesus so people who rejected Jesus saw him raise someone from the dead and they said, now we have to kill Jesus and kill this guy. They didn't want to believe. They were not going to believe even if the dead was raised. They had Moses and the prophets. I wonder if it's important for us to be familiar with the Old Testament. Those are the scriptures that Jesus says, study this and you will understand what's happening study this and you will come to believe study this and your faith will hold so it seems like jesus has a very hard high regard for scriptures and if jesus has a high regard maybe we should spend time in it as well matthew chapter 24 verses 24 through 25 it just points to this idea that our faith should be based on the bible and not just on signs and wonders if you believe in signs and wonders only it opens you up to deception. Matthew 24, verses 24 and 25 says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. If it was possible, even the elect would be deceived. But they are not. You know why? Because of what Jesus says. He says, See, I have told you beforehand. 
You know what that's called when God tells us something before it happens? Prophecy. Jesus gave us prophecy so we would know ahead of time what's supposed to happen so that we are not deceived by following signs and wonders. If someone shows up, right, and makes fire come down from heaven. Actually, the Bible mentions that one too. Revelation 13 verses 13 and 14 says he performs great signs so that even makes fire so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. We're not going to get into Revelation right now, but this is just to point out if you're following after signs and wonders, you can be deceived. It opens you up for deception. So what do we have to do to not be deceived? Be familiar with the word. That's how Jesus strengthened the faith of those disciples. He took them back to the Bible and to all the texts that pointed to him, which means the Old Testament, properly understood, points to Jesus and helps you understand Jesus even better. And then in Revelation, it says in the end, there's going to be signs and wonders. You know, fire coming down from heaven. Elijah did that. So if somebody does that, clearly they must be the Messiah, right? Imagine a man shows up in Boise somewhere. And I mean, he made fire come down from heaven, raise the dead, heal the sick. People are going to say, that's Jesus. Let's go follow him. And you're going to say, no, it's not Jesus. They're going to say, how can you say it's not Jesus? He's doing all these signs and wonders. So how do you know it's not Jesus? Well, prophecy. Because the Bible tells us when Jesus comes again, how it's going to take place. It's going to be angels and trumpets and lots of things happening. And Jesus is not going to be just walking around here, you know, if there's a baby born and there's a star above it and there's, you know, is that Jesus? No, he's not coming again as a baby. Well, how do you know? Because of the Bible. So unless you're familiar with the Bible, you're opening yourself up for deception. Jesus, when he wants to strengthen the faith of his disciples, he guides them, takes them to the Bible. We see this throughout scriptures. It's important to study the Bible. The Bible referencing itself, it says, your word, right, talking about the word of God, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible not only illuminates where we're standing right now, it shows us where we should be going, which direction we should be traveling in. And once again, I have all these uh, verses mentioned uh, on my blog in case you want to take notes and I go too fast here. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and a discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. According to Hebrews 4.12, reading the Bible is dangerous. It reveals to you your thoughts, your heart, your intentions, what you are doing. So because of that, I think many people just close it, right? Like that, that was painful. I'm going to put that away. Because he was telling me to change things in my life. He was telling me to live in a way that it's uncomfortable. I, I better leave this thing alone. And I'll tell the pastor to just preach on the nice parts, right? And that will be my, my religious experience. But you're missing out on the growth and what God wants to do in your heart and what God wants to do in your life if you're not opening this book and coming to it with an open heart saying, Lord, yes, I need guidance. Because I look at my heart, I look at myself, and, and I don't know. You know, we are so interesting. We are able to lie to ourselves and believe our own lies. And the Bible sort of stops that. It, it checks us. If you're doing it right, reading the Bible is not always pretty. It's not always comfortable. It makes us uncomfortable. But that's part of the process. That's how we grow. That's how we mature. That's God using His Word to, to guide us. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You want to do good things? You want to bless others? The Bible will help equip you and prepare you for those things. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus, when he was being tempted by Satan, he answered and said, it is written, men, women, humanity shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We compare prayer to breathing. The Bible refers to the Word of God 
as food, as sustenance, as bread. Both are important. Psalm 119, 130 says, The entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Wish you were wiser? I'm always on that boat. I always wish I knew more things. I always wish I had more experience. That's why I've surrounded myself with wonderful people of experience and wisdom. And the Bible claims that the words of God give light and give understanding. You want to learn more things? You want to be wiser? You want to make better decisions? Spend time in the Word. John 8, 31 and 32, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him, If you abide in My Word, you are My disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Abiding in the Word of Jesus, being familiar with it, living according to it, experiencing the freedom that it, that it brings. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Prayer is shaped by the word, our understanding of the Bible. So my friends, time spent in the study of the word is time well spent. Do it intentionally. Do it carefully. Do it seeking wisdom from God, not just as like a good luck charm. And we're almost done psalm 19 verse 7 says the law of the lord is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the lord is sure making wise the simple so let's get to the challenge right i gave you guys a challenge last week to pray for 10 minutes i know those of you who tried it have already some of you have shared with me what it felt like and if you haven't tried if you missed it last week give it a try and by the way the sermon is available as a podcast that means if you're not in front of a computer or youtube or facebook if you listen to podcasts you can just download it put it in your ears and just listen to it as you fold laundry or drive or things like that so i have all the messages available if you don't know what podcasts are then don't worry about it but if you do uh <laughs> They're available. Just search for PR Marlin. So the challenge. And let me tell you first. No, I'll tell you the challenge. Then I'll explain where it came from. So my challenge for you is to every day this week, open your Bible and read at least one verse. And everybody can do that, right? Open the Bible, read one verse. Can you do that? One verse? I mean, it, it takes seconds. Open the Bible and read one verse. But here's the thing. If you want to take it a step further... Pick a specific portion ahead of time so that you don't open the Bible to some random thing. You're like, well, that didn't make any sense. And then you close it up and it doesn't quite work that way. So, so I have a few recommendations if you're looking. If you already know what you're going to do, that's fine. For example, Matthew chapter 5, you can read little portions that the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, amazing part of Scripture. If you're looking for a place to start, that's one that I would recommend. Genesis chapter 37, if you like stories. Genesis 37 is the beginning of the Joseph story. It's an amazing story. You start there, you're going to enjoy what you're reading. Ruth, look up the whole book of Ruth. It's a romance. It's a beautiful love story. The whole book is only a few chapters long. Read that book. Jonah, another one, we were studying that in my Sabbath school class. The whole book has like four chapters. Start it and, and, and just read one verse and, and see how it goes. 1 Samuel talks about the, the birth of Samuel, the establishment of Saul as king, then David comes along, David and Goliath is in there. You're going to love it. You know, maybe start there. Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. You want to read the whole Gospel through? Start with Mark. Give it a try. Uh, John chapter 14 and 15 is a little bit deeper, more theological, but there's some beautiful insights there. Jesus' prayer with his disciples before the crucifixion, you're going to enjoy that as well. Psalms and Proverbs, you can't go wrong with that, right? You can read a psalm, you can read a proverb. It's practical, insightful, beautiful poetry. But the thing is, open the Bible and read at least one verse. And here's why I'm making this challenge. A while back I was reading, or I was listening, I forget now, I, I do both a lot, um, about this man who was, had great success in getting people to start running. Now, I'm not really a runner. I know I, I look like a runner, but I only run if I'm chasing something or something's chasing me. Otherwise, I'm not running. But he had this thing, right? People were saying, how do you get so many people to enjoy running or to start running? How do you get them to do that? I said, it's simple. I tell them, just put on your sneakers and step outside. Then you can go back inside. 
you see what happens by the time you put on your sneakers you put on your running clothes right and you step outside you figure ah might as well run <laughs> the hardest part was getting ready and if you think I'm gonna run a mile oh I don't want to that's gonna be so hard just put on your sneaker okay you know I'll do that so what am I trying to do here I don't want you to think I'm gonna have to read the whole Bible this year or I'm gonna have to read a chapter every day just open the Bible read one verse if you like how it's going don't keep going you don't have to stop but at least one verse each day which means if you're in a hurry if you know things are going wrong you're just like I don't feel like it but you know I took the challenge I'll just read one verse just give God that option and see how that will change and shape and affect your spiritual life now with that in mind how many of you think you can do one verse a day for this week all right so I'm gonna hold you to this challenge and when you do it please come back and let me know and by the way if you're watching online leave a comment on this video right like go back and comment like oh I've been doing it and no share your testimony that way we encourage one another my friends if we're spending time in prayer and if we're spending time in the study of the word that's how revival begins that's how your life is transformed it doesn't necessarily happen in the big flashy event a lot of times it's these habits these small habits they transform your life your life is made up of these small habits things you do every day so I'm gonna to continue to challenge you each Sabbath when you come back we're gonna have a challenge we're gonna have something nudge you out of your comfort zone but an intentional challenge that's also gonna bring about good results positive results spiritual growth personal revival a closer walk with God so I invite you to take this challenge I invite you to join us back here on Wednesday night for prayer and my friends let's familiarize ourselves with the Word of God with the things he has done with what he is like with the things that he's going to do there are benefits in there for us for those around us and for generations to come I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray father in heaven you know the fact that we're holding that we have access to the Bible today it's incredible the first 300 years of Christianity Roman emperors trying to destroy the Bible and later on Lord throughout history people have made the Bible illegal they have tortured and killed people for having the Bible burned the Bible yet it's available today and I feel Lord like you have kept it you have protected this book throughout the ages so that we would have access to it today we do not want to take this light and we do not want to take it for granted so Lord I pray not only that we would set aside the time take the time to open the Bible and to read it to study it but Lord as we do it that you would teach us that you would speak to us and that you would draw us closer to you that you would reveal to us your character and your will for our lives thank you Lord for hearing our prayers thank you for the Bible and thank you for the things that you would teach us this week as each day we open the Bible and read at least one verse thank you in advance for being our loving God bring us back bless us as we go from here I pray in Jesus name Amen I hope you were blessed by today's message if you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you or for you please feel free to contact us May God bless you and keep you till we meet again.